You know, homebrew CPUs are one thing, and by this point you all know that I've lost my mind enough to try and build one of those, but they're kind of a dime a dozen these days. So I feel like everyone and their mom kind of has one already. But homebrew transistor transistor logic graphics cards built on breadboards? Now that's a whole other story. A little harder to get your hands on one of those, and that's exactly what we're building today. So when I say transistor transistor logic graphics card built on breadboards, what exactly do I mean? Well, just so everyone uh, is on the same page, transistor transistor logic is the type of logic implemented by these little things, integrated circuits or ICs, which are the basic building block of this graphics card. Each one of them runs on five volts and implements various functions like Boolean logic, counting, arithmetic operations, and the like. A graphics card, of course, is something that takes video data and generates something that a display can show. Ours won't be so card-like, but I'm going to keep calling it that for branding purposes. And finally, a breadboard is one of these things, a prototyping board with the horizontal and vertical pins connected, which we'll be throwing our ICs on to build the thing. And with that out of the way, the key to understanding how the circuit needs to work is understanding how the signal it needs to generate works. In our case, this is a PAL composite video signal. You know, like the one that's been used since the early 20th century with those old school yellow cables. We need to figure out how to send the video data through a wire like that so that something on the other end can make sense of it. So starting from a point of near zero knowledge, I went off to do some research. And after I'd read for a while off of various websites I found around the internet, they all seemed to have this diagram on them to explain what the deal with composite video was. So let's take a look at it. The basics to understand it are the signal is analog. Meaning, in contrast to digital, it doesn't operate on zeros and ones, but rather variable voltage between zero volts and one volt. The signal is interlaced and runs at 50 Hz. This means that we send 50 frames per second, but instead of sending one whole video frame at a time, we actually send one half of the frame each time we send data, alternating then between the even lines and the odd lines. The resolution of the signal is something like 720 by 576 pixels, give or take a few depending on how the TV scans things, but we'll be operating at a much lower resolution. And I mean much lower. We're going with 208 pixels across by 240 pixels high. Also, a whole bunch of these websites include a bunch of stuff about a color blaster or something that I didn't really understand or even read about. It looks like it was kind of hacked in there since composite video was originally only supposed to be black and white. But since I don't really want to worry about that, we're only going to be making black and white video. This also makes my job much easier and saves us some video memory since now each pixel can be represented by just one bit or just one zero or one. After my initial research, I had to actually first find a screen that could display this sort of composite video signal. Nowadays, everything is fancy and digital and uses whack-ass signals like HDMI and DisplayPort. To find the few decades old screen that would actually be displaying our signal, I went out on the town to find the finest monitor that 100 Danish crowns could buy. Some off-brand digital thing with a thin green line down the middle, but it turns on just fine, it has the right port, so it should be good enough for my purposes. Anyway, we'll worry about the exact contents of the signal later on. My first task was kind of just to assimilate this knowledge into my brain and try to generate the signal in software before I even started thinking about it in hardware. Luckily, I had the perfect test bed for this sort of thing, an Arduino. These things, if you don't know what they are, are basically a convenient little microcontroller mounted on a circuit board. And if you don't know what a microcontroller is, it's basically a programmable, really, really, really underpowered and specialized computer used for controlling electronics. And if you don't know what a computer is or what electronics are, well, you're kind of a lost cause. How would you get to this video? Anyway, typically you would program the Arduino in this custom processing-like language with a fancy IDE and all, but I realized really quickly that this just wouldn't be fast enough to generate the video signal, so I had to crack open Vim and bust out the old C skills once more. I am inevitable. And after many hours, of course, of beating my head against a circuit board-shaped wall, I was able to get the Arduino spitting something out that resembled a real video signal. It was a little messed up, but to start with, I mean, anything is better than nothing. And with some more attempts at getting things to work, reaching various levels of success as you can see here, I eventually got a stable image drawing. Well, by image, I kind of just mean a white square, but you know, that's definitely progress. 
and there was still this weird thing happening near the top with the square that I kind of had to figure out. But soon after that, I had some vertical lines drawing showing that the Arduino was actually making pixels and not just one big white block. And eventually I fixed up this bendy issue at the top so that there were stable vertical lines on the screen. Turns out this exercise was actually really useful since it helped me a lot in understanding how the video signal should actually look. Anyway, on to the next step, making a circuit for this bad boy. So while this runs on in the background, I'll explain exactly how this works. The circuit runs with a 4 MHz clock, so each clock cycle is exactly 250 nanoseconds, or there are 4 million clock cycles per second. It's based around two counters, one 10-bit counter to count every half scan line up to a total of 624 per frame, and another 8-bit counter to count 256 times each scan line. I call these the half scan line or HSC counter, and tick or TKC counter respectively. The 10-bit counter is incremented once every 128 clock cycles, so it rolls over 50 times a second, and the 8-bit counter is incremented with every clock cycle, so it rolls over every 64 microseconds, which is exactly the length of one scan line. So now if we take a better look at the signal, we can understand why these two counters need to be how they are. So let's pull this diagram back up and take a closer look at it. The signal actually has four different parts, but ours will have six since I've added in some blank padding space on either end of the actual video data. These are just empty or black scan lines. This means that out of our 624 half scan lines, the 10 bit counter goes through five equalization pulses, five post equalization pulses, 32 scan lines or 64 count of blank scan lines. 240 scan lines or 480 count where we send actual pixel data to the screen, then 32 more blank scan lines, and finally 6 pre-equalization pulses, for a total of 624 half scan lines or 312 scan lines. Similarly, the tick counter divides up into 4 different periods for each part of the scan line. There are 4 microseconds of sync at 0 volts, 6 microseconds of back porch at 0.3 volts, 52 microseconds of actual data, sending 0.3 volts for black and 1.0 volts for white. And finally, 2 microseconds of front porch at 0.3 volts to finish the scan line. And how do we keep track of these counters? Well, each one of these circuits here is a comparator. It just takes in the counter value and compares it against some constant number to determine when we need to go to the next state of each counter. And how do we track the states from these comparators? Through these circuits, called SR latches. Each one has a set signal, which sets the value of the latch to 1, and a reset signal, which resets the value of the latch to 0. If we hook these up in succession to our comparators, with the right numbers, we know exactly where we are in the period of each counter. Only one SR latch is triggered at a time for each of the two counters. And after that, the circuit is kind of simple, basically just a bunch of combinatorial logic to figure out exactly when 0 volts, 0 0.3 volts, and 1 volt should be emitted. Oh, and to get this thing to display a real image? Super easy. For that, we just hook up some memory, in our case a read-only memory chip, and then we just use the HSC counter and the top 5 bits of the TKC counter to figure out what byte to look at in the memory. Then we use the bottom 3 bits of the TKC counter to figure out which bit to show on the screen, either a 0 or a 1, which of course correspond to black or white. This does lead to kind of a f***y video memory layout where the image isn't actually contiguous in memory and each line of video data has 5 bytes of nothing before it and 1 byte of nothing after it, but it's really convenient to implement on the circuit. And that's the whole thing. Hope things aren't too complicated and that this is easy to build. It would be a shame if all of this ended up becoming some giant mess of wires across 7 breadboards that's wildly unstable if you even try and touch it, but we'll figure that out when we start to build it. But first, after this fancy circuit diagram was done, I had to convert it into something that could actually be built with those integrated circuits. Logisim wasn't exactly equipped with all of the ICs that I needed to get this diagram working, so I had to break up the Java programming skills first to add in some extra circuits to the simulator. And once those were in, I got to the circuit design. Initially, I was going to have each wire drawn visually like you can see here, but well, also as you can see here, that started getting really messy really, really fast. So I changed two tunnels for everything, which has the added benefit of giving nice labels for all of the wires. And yeah, I know this isn't exactly what Logisim was really intended for, but I mean, who cares? Once the circuit was cooked up, it was finally time to build this for real. So after a few orders from some electronics companies, a couple trips down to the local store, I had everything I needed to build the circuit. 
And so I got started on a live stream, actually. Uh, it got off to a fun start, being my first stream and all. What's good? Can you guys hear me all right? Can you guys see me? Yeah, there, there are way more of you in here than I thought there would be. So are you all just like unemployed or something? Anyway, this is what we're this is what we're making today. Okay, I think TC has the ripple count output on this. Can anyone confirm or deny that? Does anyone else? Is anyone like, if you're following along at home with your data sheets, um, then tell me if TC is the right output. Let's see, is it is electronics half reading the chip stocks and half failing at wiring? Uh, mostly failing at wiring, if you're me. I'm not seeing any yeses or dab emojis in the chat, so that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, let's see if when I turn this thing on, uh, like my power goes out or something. That could be fun. Oh, that would make for an interesting stream at least. Hmm, you know, pray, pray to whatever god you worship. Check it out! That's super cool. That's the first time I've ever done anything with like integrated circuits. <laughs> Dab emojis if you're okay with me moving the camera. Not that this is a democracy and you guys have any say. <laughs> Eventually I got everything figured out and everyone had their chance to yell at me in chat for not knowing a single thing about electrical engineering. They are 5 volt LEDs. I don't need 5- these are 5 volt LEDs. I do not need a resistor for these. No, please stop spamming resistors. I, these are 5 volt LEDs. And by the end of the stream I had 8 bits of the 10 bit counter wired and running. Okay, so that's bit- this is gonna count 8 bits by the way. You know, if- assuming everything is correct. Uh, let's get up to 16. Okay, and then ripple carry? Oh, no, that totally didn't work. Okay, we did something wrong. Thanks to everyone who showed up. There will definitely be more streams in the future. After the stream, though, it was back to regularly recording things and assembling the circuit. And this ended up taking a long while. Please ignore the massive skips in the middle. This really did take a long time. And it included some fun bugs, such as non-functional integrated circuits, voltages that hung out in between 0 and 5 volts, which caused floating values and unpredictable logic. Well, the whole deal, really, anything that people warn you about when you're building a circuit that can happen kind of did happen. It's not like it wasn't my fault either, to be honest. I am, to put it very lightly, terribly unqualified to be building something like this. In spite of that fact, though, I did eventually get the circuit to throw up an image onto the screen. Well, not a real image, but just using one of the bits of the tick counter to toggle between 0 and 1 on each scan line. The final bit of the circuit build was the part that handled the memory. For this I had to build my own Arduino-based EEPROM programmer to make something for the images to be read off of. God bless you, Ben Eater, for your video on this topic. Of course, when this is hooked up to the final machine, it will be using real video RAM instead of a read-only memory chip. Anyway, once the EEPROM was properly programmed and hooked up, the first tests of this were, well, okay, but there were still a few issues to iron out. And then more issues later. And, well, things, things went okay. And finally, now we're kind of caught up to real time. See, I really wanted to use the graphics card to display an image for the thumbnail for the video, but you can see all these errors in it, so I kind of needed to debug those. There's this clipping on the edges that can't be avoided, these gray lines, and some more data errors, but I'm, I'm sure this will be easy to fix. One hour later. Okay, about an hour later, we have a white screen, which is good. This is what I'd expect. None of the garbage we had earlier, at least. Three hours later. Okay, a uh, few more hours, and well, no progress. I'll, I'll check back in a bit. One eternity later. It's midnight. I finally realized that the problem isn't me. It is the EEPROM. It's too slow. I'm going to sleep. So after countless hours of working on this, I finally realized something when combing through the docks for the thousandth time, this EEPROM chip isn't fast enough to dry the screen. That's why we have these gray lines, that's why the data is messed up, 
At a load speed of 150 nanoseconds, there's just no way that it can keep up with the clock speed of 250 nanoseconds when the delays of all the other logic are taken into account. This is my best working theory at least. So until further notice, this is the best we've got. And to be honest, I'd say it's pretty damn good for a homebrew graphics card. With that though, thank you very much for watching. Be sure to come back for my next video where I'll be building the rest of the components for this computer. And I'll see you then.